Hi, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm the host, Robert Bryce. This podcast uh, is a place where we focus on energy, politics, innovation, um, and energy. How did I usually say it? Energy, power, innovation, and politics. Okay, so in any order you like, those are the issues we cover. Today, my guest is Ted Nordhaus. He is the founder and executive director of the Breakthrough Institute. Ted, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Robert. Good to see you again. Yeah, thanks. Um, we, I first talked to you maybe 12 years ago or so, um, interviewed you when I was writing for a, a energy related publication back when, um, I interviewed you and, and Michael Schellenberger and I could give you a long introduction in addition to your, your title at breakthrough, but, uh, I like to let guests introduce themselves. So please, if you just arrived at a dinner party or somewhere else and you don't know anyone there, if you don't mind, who are you? Yeah, my name is Ted Nordhaus. I'm the founder and executive director of the Breakthrough Institute. Uh, we're a think tank based in uh, Oakland, California, that focuses on technological solutions to environmental problems uh, and how we um, create a future where nine or 10 billion people get to live modern uh reasonably prosperous lives like you and I live on an ecologically vibrant planet. So what makes your think tank different? What, what's different? There are dozens and dozens. I've been in a think tank. I'm kind of I'm an affiliate, I'm a visiting fellow with a think tank now in Austin called Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity. What makes Breakthrough different? Well, we are, um, uh, you know, we are heterodox in a number of ways. We are the world's first eco-modernist think tank um, and really, uh, I think there are not a lot of uh, think tanks that uh, invi invented an ism, and uh, <laughs> we did. Uh, it's called eco-modernism, um, and it focuses on, uh, you know, the idea behind eco-modernism is that uh, the solution to environmental problems is not hair shirts or degrowth or kind of going back to how we lived before the industrial revolution, but that the only solution to environmental issues is through more development, more growth, more technology, more industrialization. Um, we're pro-nuclear and we believe that um, if you want to leave more room for non-human nature on this planet, you need to shrink the human footprint, which means you need dense cities, you need dense energy and power systems, uh, and you need nuclear energy, and you need intensive, uh, very efficient, highly productive, large-scale agriculture. Um, so it's really uh, uh, intensive uh, agriculture, uh, uh, dense, um, uh, high, high, uh, dense, high energy future and cities, uh, sure. people living, um, you know, not in rural, uh, sort of agrarian context, but in urban cosmopolitan, big, big global cities. So tell me about you, you've been around energy issues all your, your, much of your life. Your dad was general counsel of the department of energy. What yeah. was that like? Well, uh, he was general counsel at DOE in the first Clinton administration. He was the first general counsel at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and really sort of invented sort of modern uh, energy regulatory law at the, at the federal level. At, at the FERC. Uh, and what, what year was that? Uh, he went to FERC right, uh, you know, in probably 77, um, uh, right after uh, Carter's election when FERC was created and when really uh, right around the time that the Department of Energy was actually created. Um, he also drafted, uh, was sort of the primary legal architect of the uh, Federal uh, Clean Air Act and, you know, uh, particularly drafted the provisions of the Federal Clean Air Act uh, that were uh, utilized to develop the Obama administration's clean power plan, which attempted to regulate CO2 emissions. So you've grown up around this for a long time, policy, and so you grew up in Washington, D.C. then? Yeah, I grew up on Capitol Hill, six blocks from the Capitol. Uh -huh. um, so yeah. this policy stuff comes to you naturally then? Or, or, yeah, or, sort or, of weirdly, yeah. I think you just, uh, I never really thought I was going to end up doing this, but it turns out I sort of ended up in the family business. <laughs> So let's jump forward then to, and, and you went to school, you went to university on the East Coast then or? No, or, no, I went to Berkeley. Cal so, okay. So you've been in California now for, because I'm, I want to talk about California. There are a lot of yeah. things happening in California. Uh, come back to that. But in 2007 uh, with Michael Schellenberger, you published this book, Breakthrough from the Death of Environmentalism to the Politics of Possibility. 
Wired reviewed it and said, green groups may carp, but the truth is that the book could turn out to be the best thing to happen to environmentalism since Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. That's a big claim now, seven or 13 years ago. How important was that book to your career? I mean, I think the book was important to my career. I think, you know, we really sort of, um, we had sort of a website called Breakthrough prior to the book, but really 2007 was when we sort of decided with the book to sort of launch a proper think tank. Um, and it really, in the process of researching that book, you know, I think if you go back, that book kind of came out of an essay that we'd authored a few years before called The Death of Environmentalism. And, um, you know, we wrote The Death of Environmentalism, sort of arguing for a big public investment in clean energy technology. And I, I think, you know, in some ways, our view on that at that time wasn't really that different from Al Gore's. You know, we have all the technology we need. We just need to sort of get the politics sorted out so that we can make this big transition. And I think it was really in the process of writing that book that we got clear that, no, in fact, we really don't have all the technology that we need. Um, and there's going to be a need for just an enormous amount of innovation to uh, where we really sort of dubbed the term make clean energy cheap if you wanted to sort of deeply cut global carbon emissions. Right. Um, so that's really a lot of the argument of that book um, and really a lot of the work that, that uh, I've done at Breakthrough uh, ever since is sort of figure out how you get from here to there. Um, and I think that book, you know, I don't know about Silent Spring, but I think that book had, uh, and the work in the essay, The Death of Environmentalism that came before it did have a really big, um, ish uh, impact on sort of, you know, a, a, as sort of difficult and problematic and sometimes wrong as the environmental community, the mainstream environmental community still often is, I think there's sort of some big shifts. So if you, you know, that book, more, the most more, more acceptance of nuclear would be one of those. More, more acceptance right? of nuclear, um, which interestingly, we didn't actually really make an argument for in that book. Um, that came after. But I think the most important thing in that book, um, and, and it's almost quaint to say right now, is, uh, you know, the dominant sort of environmental paradigm for how you were going to deal with climate change when we wrote that book was that you were just going to kind of regulate it like any other kind of pollution problem in the same way that, you know, we had sort of dealt with clean air and clean water through the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. And the radical thing, and the thing that just we were savaged over was basically saying that we were not going to regulate our way to a clean energy, a global clean energy economy. I mean, just it was such a controversial thing to say at that time. And basically, we said the only way you're going to get there is with, you know, really big public investment in technology and infrastructure uh -huh. um, to make clean energy cheap. And, um, you know, now that's really kind of kind of everyone basically accepts that and so much so that people have kind of forgotten what a wildly controversial idea it was 15 years ago. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting way to think about it. I want to come back to that idea about carbon taxation and regulation, because um, uh, one of the other things that is interesting, you're, you're one of the few people, the only people I know who's, who has kin who have won the Nobel Prize. Your uncle, uh, William Nordhaus, won the the Nobel Prize in 2018, but I want to come back to that. So, you know, this is another question I'd like to ask of guests, um, and I've asked it of many of them who've been on the podcast. How would you describe your politics? Because you are you came from the left, right? You're kind of a diehard Democrat in some ways, but then a lot of your ideas have gained traction on the right. Um, so, how how do you describe your politics? Uh, you know, um, Brian Walsh, uh, who's a uh, I consider a you know certainly a, a colleague and 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 a friend, someone who uh, he really is a reporter. He he was uh, covered climate issues for Time Magazine for a bunch of years, and he's at Axios now. And I don't know, a decade or so ago, Brian described breakthrough as unclassifiable Californians, um, and that is a <laughs> that's a badge that I wear very proudly. Um, you know, to your point, I definitely came out of the left, uh, but I don't consider myself sort of of the left at this point because I think in a bunch of ways, sort of contemporary progressivism has sort of lost the, <laughs> uh, lost the thread uh, a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, I, you know, I'm still really, really committed to the idea of um, sort of broadly shared prosperity for everyone, 
I think there's a really important role for uh, governments to play uh, in in sort of helping nations and the world get to a place where where we're there. Uh, but you know, I I think a lot of that has uh, more to do with sort of sustained S investments in public goods um, versus the kind of sort of real. Uh, zero sum redistribution that I think a lot of folks on the left uh, now believe uh, is sort of uh, the sort of primary role of government. So uh, I want to talk about California because you're you're unclassifiable, unclassifiable Californian, but that idea of the progressive <clears throat> agenda in California is really, I mean, you look at the uh, particularly at the blackouts lately and 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 the homelessness issues there; those are key. But I, I, I wanted to ask this question first. So you mentioned the Eco-Modernist Manifesto that came out in 2015. Um, that, I think, w in my view, it was key in terms of changing some minds or changing uh, the outlook of a number of people on nuclear and on GMOs. What, how do you see it? What, how, did the, how important was that, that publication of the manifesto then five years ago? What's changed since then, perhaps, is the best, way to, best question. Yeah, I mean, I think the manifesto was, um, you know, if, if you kind of, kind of, think about us as having started out as really as critics um, uh, of sort Heretic, of conventional heretics, environmentalism. Maybe. Pardon? <laughs> heretics. Heretics, critics. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and we always sort of said like, yeah, you know, we are critics, we are heretics, um, but we also are, um, you know, we're not just sort of contrarians. We're not sort of just deconstructing environmentalism for the sake of deconstructing it, we wanna kind of reconstruct an alternative paradigm for sort of thinking about the environment and human development and the relationship between them. Um, and that really, you know, it took us almost a decade to get there, um, really from sort of the publication, oh, well, more than a decade, the publication of Death of Environmentalism, which is the sort of originary critique to the, which was in 2004 to the, publication of the Eco-Modernist Manifesto in 2015, but really the Eco-Modernist Manifesto is the sort of central sort of reconstruction of an environmental politics and an environmental worldview that we think is just sort of much more appropriate to the big environmental and human development challenges that we're going to be faced with, that we are faced with in the 21st century. Um, well, that's an interesting way to think about it because what pops in my head when you say that is, as the way I would abbreviate it would be pro-human, pro-technology, pro-energy. Yeah, uh, which, which, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that 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 pretty well defines where I come from, right? You know, to me, I don't see this in a in I don't see energy as as a partisan issue. You either have it or you don't, right? And right. you want it, you and everybody wants a bunch of it, right? And they want it now. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I mean, obviously, you've done really important work on that, Robert, to just kind of point out, like, how transformational, sort of having not just access to a little bit of energy, but a lot of modern energy is for people all over the world. Um, and you really can't, um, you can't separate it from right. just sort of basic development processes that kind of help people get out of just deep subsistence agrarian poverty, move into the wage economy, um, you know, be able to um, sort of uh, afford just basic modern amenities yeah. that everybody, all of us take for lighting. granted. Yeah, all the air conditioning, all these things that we, yeah. that we take for granted. Well, so let's, let's talk about California then, because that issue of, of energy availability and the price of energy are things in California that are, I mean, these are top of mind. So what's the sentiment in California? I know you're, you're in New Mexico now. You said uh, before we started recording, you're uh, a, a, a refugee from the fires. I mean, you're not a real refugee. Your house wasn't burned down, I'm assuming. Um, but so far. What's happened to the sentiment in among regular Californians, not just since the fires, but also the blackouts that now happened last year, they happened this year. They, they, I mean, what I see, and I'll you know b reveal my cards, the, 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 the management of the electric grid in California, or the management of the electric grid is basic, fundamental governance, right? That, that the governments cannot fail. And the, the failure of the electric grid, the failure of the blackouts, in my view, complete epic failure of governance in California. So that's my view. What, 
what is your sentiment? What do you, how does this sentiment changed about the, since the blackouts hit toward nuclear, toward electricity? What's, has, has it changed at all? I don't, I mean, I, I'll say a couple of things that you might disagree with, Robert. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, for conservatives, particularly like sort of like, you know, there's a, a you know, just, just, just uh, bad things that happen in California are just really, really easy slotted easily slotted into this sort of category of kind of proof of the folly of progressivism. Um, and look, I think progressives in California's progressive leaders uh, have plenty to uh, account for um, in these problems. But a lot of these problems are a lot older than, you know, have been going on for a lot longer than the sort of last 10, 15 years that sort of Democrats have been increasingly sort of hegemonic politically in California. I mean, um, you know, a lot of it happened under Schwartz, you know, all this was going under on under Arnold Schwarzenegger and frankly under Pete Wilson before him. Um, you know, Republicans up until about a decade ago did actually sort of have a reasonable veto um, over the, um, uh, uh, oh, you know, legislatively. Um, and, you know, like also, you know, conservatives and Republicans did actually pass a whole set of uh, constitutional amendments on the ballot that have also sort of deeply constrained um, what the state's political leadership was able to do in terms of budgets, in terms of taxation. Um, it's made the state really overly reliant on income taxes. So, you know, it puts us in this situation where we have the most progressive income tax uh, rate uh, rates uh, or system in the country, and yet the highest levels of income inequality as well. Um, and it's gotten worse despite this sort of progressive tax code that ostensibly is there to redistribute wealth. So, you know, I, when you look at the electrical grid in California, um, you know, and you look at the sort of neglect of um, sort of uh, you know, the, the fire risk uh, associated with the grid, um, you know, that's on sort of several decades and generations of political leaders in the state. Um, it's also on like a, a PUC that, um, you know, both PG and E resisted uh, sort of rate facing, as did the rate payer advocate groups that normally are sort of have an adversarial position towards PG and E. Um, so it's just can very. I, can I can I interrupt you there yeah. for a minute, just a minute because PG and E went bankrupt twenty years ago. They went bankrupt yep. again last year. That the, twenty years ago it was from everything that I my first book was on Enron. The, yeah. the, the system was a was easily gameable and it was gamed. Um, and yeah. now they've gone bust again. I'm talking to a, a friend of mine who thinks they're going to go bankrupt again because of the way that that's the the system there is simply unmanageable. So, but is this the fault of the Okay, so simple question. Is it the fault of the, the utility or the regulators not looking out for the ratepayers? Where, where, who's to blame I, I, here? It I just, it just, the, it just become, uh, it, look, look PG&E and the whole electrical system has just become a, a projection screen for all sorts of sort of fabulous agendas. Um, from, <laughs> like the, you know, projection run, screen for fabulous agendas. You know, that's, look, that first bankruptcy was really the, 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 the result of, a, um, you know, kind of crazy scheme to complete, basically completely uh, sort of liberalize uh, the electrical and deregulate California's electrical system, which then, of course, created this sort of incredible opportunities to game the system. Um, you know, this second round of pg e was a function really of the fires um you know uh i i think a bit much has been made of these rolling blackouts uh, you know um there's been a lot of kind of conflation of the, the the safety the power safety uh the shutoffs for safety reasons which were a big deal last year with uh sort of shutoffs that were really kind of not actually um anything comparable to what we saw last year this year uh in the rolling blackouts you know a few hours for you know a uh, few tens of thousands of people actually mostly uh was what was actually was really going on it wasn't like the whole power system was down for you know, significant number of periods of time. Um, but yeah, you know, the state ought to be doing better. We didn't, you know, they didn't uh, account for not, an, enough reserve. Um, they knew that 
um, there was a risk that this was happening, this would happen and they decided to take the risk. Um, and, uh, and they made a bad bet and that was the act, that was the regulators, it was not the utility. Right. So, I mean, honestly, I'll tell you the one thing I would not wanna do is be trying to run PG&E or any of these, these <laughs> utilities in the state of California right now, because I think it's an impossible job. I think the expectations uh, from ratepayers, from regulators, mm -hmm. from politicians, from the sort of environmental advocacy groups, uh, are, it's just impossible. Um, yeah. to kind of how many how many CEOs has PG&E had in the last God, three, you know years? exactly I mean, it's, and it's like it's, a, it's, it's like a revolving uh, door if it was a management problem you think they would have fixed it but I just think we've kind of created sort of impossible a, a set of contradictory tensions and just impossible expectations in the state and the politicians love to rail against PG&E and they kind of threaten to take the system public but of course they won't take it public because they don't want the responsibility for running the system <laughs> you know That's they want to they want to they want they want they want a uh you know um you know they want a private sector punching bag um right. to blame all the problems it's on easily and it's, to, it's, their, uh, it's their it's their fault not ours yeah right. yeah they want to outsource the responsibility yeah. So, well, then that one of the, that leads to the next obvious question. So, is this going to affect the, the 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 looming the scheduled closure of Diablo Canyon beginning in 2024? Is there a chance now that some sanity in a state that has these lofty climate goals that they're going to keep this really important uh, source of zero carbon electricity on the grid? Is that is what's the God? You know, I keep thinking that that sort of we're ripe for reconsidering. <laughs> Uh, that and that, uh, but I, boy, I just, um, it just, you know, obviously a lot of us have kind of made this point and sort of thought through various frameworks where you could keep that plant open um, and, and sort of, you know, both sort of help the state much in a much more effective, cost-effective way meet its climate goals. Um, but but I, I just see no evidence that there's any uh, any appetite you know, for of, that. There's no constituency for it. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the odd things about we're looking at the the electric grid, and you know, of course, I just made a film about electricity and have a new book about it. But Illinois now, Exelon just announced they're going to close two of their big nuclear plants in Illinois, the Byron and Dresden stations. Um, those two plants by themselves produce twice as much electricity as all the solar and all the wind in Illinois. And yet there's no, uh, there's no constituency there to keep them open. There, there was a constituency, I think, in New York to keep Indian Point open, but it was Democrats in those states that are saying, you know, no, we're going to close it, right? De Democratic right. leadership. So what, what seems to me curious now, and I've, I've written a little bit about this, is that the Democratic Party in their platform that came out this year for the first time in 48 years said, we're pro-nuclear, which is important. But at the same time, there's this other tension going on in California, in Illinois, in New York, the most democratic states in, this, in the country where the nuclear plants are being shuttered and it appears there's no constituency for keeping them open despite the stated platform. It, how do you see that? I mean, it, it, yeah, really I mean, I, I think, politics I think here. this is where, you know, there's, I, I think it's, um, you know, the, the problem that the Demo Democrats have is that is that the sort of environmental community is a big part of its of its kind of coalition and constituency. The environmental community has kind of come around theoretically on sort of keeping plants open, but they sort of still, uh, I don't think they are really terribly committed to it. So, right. you know, there's sort of three overlapping things that happen in these, when we get into these sort of state kind of situation, state level situations. Um, the first is that uh, the environmental groups, um, uh, they make, well, it's really two things. They make two demands. And the, the first is they say uh, you need to, um, you know, if we're going to kind of bail these plants out, if we're going to kind of keep these plants open, then we need lots of goodies, more goodies, more subsidies and supports for renewable energy as well. Um, so the nuclear plants get kind of held hostage to sort of more funding for renewables. Um, in places that often have already made fairly substantial commitments to renewables. Um, the second thing that happens is they say, if we're going to kind of bail these plants out, um, uh, the utilities need to open their books and show that they're losing money on the plants. Um, and the reality is that 
it's not a, really a question so much of whether the utility is losing money on the plant. It's whether they could make more money by closing the plant and just running their gas plants more with gas at, you know, God, whatever, two to four cents a kilowatt hour. Right. Um, and so, and so, you know, from a utility perspective where they're, these are private companies that are, are trying to sort of maximize uh, their return on investment, you know, they kind of go, you know, we close this plant down, we run gas, we make more money. Um, right. So if you want us to prove that we're losing money on the plants, we can't do that. And then uh, the although, third thing. Although, Ex although Exelon has said in Illinois, in their public statement, in their press release, that we'll open our books on these plants and let, let, let the lawmakers look at them. So, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, it's just a, an extraordinary situation where you have the, the, the party platform is very much about climate change. And yet the key bits of infrastructure that are helping deal with climate change are being shuttered because there's these other agendas that, as you say, have, well, you know, still pushing renewables. And, and Ken Caldera had an interesting point later. He said, why, if you have nuclear, why would you ever build wind turbines? <laughs> it was right, just, right. He had something on Twitter about that the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Um, yeah. And I, I was just going to say, I think the third thing, and maybe this is the most important, True. is that you know, both the utilities and the environmental groups um, have sort of treated these as kind of one-off bailout negotiations to just sort of bail out individual plants uh -huh. rather than saying, you know, let's value all zero carbon energy the same in the electrical system. Um, so that, that there's, so, no know, over, there's no over, there's no, there's uh, no, well, how do you say, how do you, how would you say it? There's no overarching kind of policy or, or not a broader right, picture. Of right. In other words, and what you see in Illinois is they went and bailed out four plants that were going to shut down. Right. And then like, you know, you get a couple of years out and it's like, Hey, here's another two that are in trouble. And we want to shut down. And, you know, I said all along, look, you, you, you just need to, Illinois has a renewable portfolio standard right now. Um, and if you just kind of basically grandfathered all the existing, existing nuclear into that standard, you would have, you know, kind of a mandate, you, you, you're at like 80% zero carbon energy with a mandate to grow that. Um, and, um, you know, if you, and, and, and once you do that, it sort of goes like, okay, well, you know, if Exelon has a proposal to actually close these plants down and replace it with solar or wind or something else that's zero carbon, go for it. Um, but what we're not going to do is shut down nuclear plants and replace them with coal and gas. Right. So that that requires, so if I'm hearing you right, I'll just repeat it back. So instead of a piecemeal approach that the, the nuclear plants need to be considered under something like an RPS, but, but it wouldn't that have to be done at the federal level? I mean, you no. know, there's, there's, you, so the states could do that. Just to, yeah, just the as a, can do that. They could do it tomorrow. Right. But the problem in Illinois too, is, <laughs> I mean, it's almost, it's not comical. There's nothing funny about it, but the, but Exelon just paid a $200 million fine for a, yeah. a, 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 in a bribery scandal involving their nuclear plants. And right. the same thing right. happened in Ohio. So, you know, it's, it yeah, I mean, the, look, the whole thing is kind of, um, it's just, it's grubby and dirty. But <laughs> Angels. grubby, yeah. And, and grubby and dirty is, uh, yeah. I mean, it's part of the, the battle as I see it, it's part of the ongoing battle over the grid. Who's going to get access, who's going to get preference, who's going to get the right. mandates and the subsidies and that it's a $400 billion business. Well, of course there's going to be battles and it's a very diffused business. And who's going to pay for it? And who's going to pay for it? Which is the the part that to me is really uh, important and 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 too too little discussed is the regressive nature of a lot of these policies. Yeah. But that 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 uh, uh, that's a, that's a longer discussion than what we yeah. have for today. Yeah. Um, so how do you do? You're you're the, the the executive director of the think tank. How do you quantify success then at Breakthrough Institute? To back back to kind of that that your role as a administrator, as a manager, as a, uh, uh, someone who manages intellectuals, what, how do you manage or how do you, how do you quantify success? Uh, well, you know, there's quantifying success and there's managing intellectuals and those two things are not always, um, <laughs> consistent with one another. Um, let's put it that way. Um, but, uh, I, I will say that, uh, you know, I mean, I think we have a, a very sort of discursive, uh, you know, our sort of, you know, what call it, theory of change um, is very much sort of built, you know, we're a think tank, it's focused on ideas, it's uh, focused on, you know, I mean, I think we try to kind of get out in front of these debates and push really, really hard um, on, on sort of at the frontier of kind of how we think about the issues. We're willing to be disruptive, we're willing to be controversial. 
Um, you know, we're not trying to kind of create consensus um, by sort of papering over all sorts of differences. Um, we're much more focused on kind of going out and, and um, making kind of, you know, actually being argumentative. Um, uh -huh. And um, uh, just kind causing, of- Causing friction. Yeah, cause some friction, cause some sort of cognitive dissonance. Um, and then sort of really kind of get out, you know, we do a lot of research and, and, and uh, increasingly we do a lot of original research. Um, the, you know, we used to do a lot of uh, what I would call literature reviews where we go and sort of summarize the existing literature. And then you just get to this point where you've kind of summarized the literature and the answers it has on like really, really core questions um, are pretty unsatisfactory. Right. Um, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, we I'm, do I'm research. familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do, re we, you know, we do a lot of research and then we do um, a lot of policy development. So, you know, we put a proposal out earlier this year for reforming clean energy subsidies um, pretty, pretty radically to just sure. sort of focus on um, kind of really kind of focusing subsidies on earlier stage technologies rather than, you know, basically paying you know, a third the cost of for Chinese solar panels that are not remotely on the kind of technological frontier of what's possible. And that that's how clean energy subsidies work now. I'd much rather they were directed at advanced nuclear or at energy storage. Um, rather than, than, I know you're than, not a big fan of wind, but I actually think that, um, you know, some of these sort of new, really big, more much further offshore wind technologies uh, uh, may be pretty important. Um, and I, sure. you know, I'm, I, I don't think we need to be paying two cents a kilowatt hour for more onshore wind in the United States uh, as a subsidy, but I'd be willing to subsidize, you know, 12 megawatt, 60% capacity factor offshore turbines uh, for a while. So what they just a, a quick break. So uh, thanks for uh, tuning into the, the Power Hungry podcast. I'm talking to Ted Nordhaus. He's the founder and executive director of the Breakthrough Institute in Oakland. Um, so Ted, uh, um, I've got a lot more questions, but uh, the call to action. So you want people to go to the website? How do you want uh, listeners to follow your work? What, how, how would they yeah, do that? Well, you can follow our work a couple of different ways. We have a, a weekly newsletter. You can subscribe to at our, our website. It's called, uh, uh, the address for the website is the Breakthrough uh, dot org. Um, uh, you know, you can follow a lot of our work on our website. Uh, you can follow uh, me on Twitter uh, at I'm just at Ted Nordhaus. You can follow uh, Breakthrough uh, through our account at the BTI. But let's move on, and <clears throat> if you don't mind, and talk about um, a recent piece that you published in Foreign Policy about, which I thought was really interesting, about nuclear subsidies and <clears throat> I'm sorry, nuclear politics in Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Um, and you wrote it with uh, with uh, Seaver Wong, who's at at the breakthrough. <clears throat> you said in all three nations, the nuclear power sector has become closely identified with long entrenched political parties and the and the power of state bureaucracies. And because of that, that opposition to nuclear power has been seen as a as a way to oppose the the incumbent parties. <clears throat> but you said that the uh, uh, that this that that problem that these these government issued monopolies quasar cartels of favored companies have have made nuclear energy uh, a symbol of the old guard and that that's a, have I have I summarized that yes, pretty fairly absolutely absolutely well I I didn't know any well I knew that you know Japan had closed down their plants in in the wake of of the Fukushima uh, 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 meltdowns. But I, I didn't realize that in South Korea and the Taiwan that the anti-government and anti-nuclear segments were were so closely aligned. How important is that? And if it, and how important is that that those three countries, which you point out, have significant CO two emissions, uh, uh, may be turning or appear to be turning away from nuclear? How important is that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it is important. And it you know I mean for me I think the thing that's interesting is sort of. You know, as a pro-nuclear advocate, I think even within the nuclear community, there's a lot of confusion <laughs> about what sort of, sometimes it's confusion, and frankly, sometimes I think it's just disingenuous about what the nuclear, what a sort of, sort of viable nuclear future looks like. Um, so, can I, well, can I interrupt because I, 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 as you're, as you're saying that, um, um, if I can interrupt for just a second, because yeah. You're saying the pro-nuclear future, but it, 
how much of that is about the US and how much of it is international, right? right. Because this is the big, the big separation, right? Because right. we need strong governments that are pro nuclear, right to make it right. prolifer uh, proliferate to grow in, in, in other countries. Yeah, I think there's two paths for nuclear. Um, and they're not actually consistent with one another. So the, the traditional path for nuclear, which is represented in all three of these East Asian economies, is, you know, a pretty uh, strong centralized government. Um, uh, you know, I mean, these were basically one party states with a permanent bureaucracy and a centrally planned economy. Um, and if your nuclear future is predicated on really big sort of conventional light water reactors, um, that's, that's, that's the model. Uh, uh -huh. You know, there's just no plausible way. And if you're not going to basically nationalize your power sector, um, you know, have a single nuclear builder, owner, operator, who's just gonna kind of crank out Gen 2 or Gen 3 reactors, one after another after another, one gigawatt at a time. There's just no way you have to have a fully planned, centrally administered power sector. Liberalized electricity markets, liberalized economies, uh, they can't do it and they're not gonna do it. Um, so, so, this is, so this is Ross Adam or Ross Atom in Russia is the classic example yeah, of this. Yeah, right? it's Ross Atom. It's, it's um, uh, you know, it's, it's EDF and Arriva, you know, during this sort of heyday of the French nuclear build out. Um, and I guess you know, SK now in, in South Korea as well. That, that yeah, built yeah, exactly. Yeah. These are functionally state-owned enterprises that are sort of enmeshed in a centrally planned economy that is building out a centrally planned electrical grid. So right. if your vision for the future is more big sort of Gen 2, Gen 3 reactors, then, then you are really frankly being dishonest if you're not also saying my vision for the future is a centrally planned economy with a centrally planned and administered um, uh, power government, sector right. and with state-owned enterprises basically building all these reactors and operating them. Um, on the other hand, if you're kind of like, no, you know, like we got to deal with climate change and we need a reliable power sector, but we want a sort of more liberalized um, economy, we don't want central planning, we don't want a centrally planned or publicly owned electrical grid, um, then, then big nuclear reactors are completely inconsistent with that. Um, right. And, you know, you're going to be looking at advanced reactors. You know, you're going to look at a range of much smaller technologies. You're going to look at sort of liberalized uh, power sectors. Um, uh, with, that with, are pri with, with private capital playing a big role in, in that rollout the, and, and private generators playing a b bigger role in the electric grid. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, and, and honestly, I sort of think that we'll see, you know, I mean, I think outside of sort of some of these uh, Asian economies and a few other places, I think everything's kind of moving towards that second model. And so you need, a, you need nuclear technologies that are consistent with that model. So um, less, uh, to, 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 uh, would it be fair to say a less centralized model, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Less centralized both in terms of political power, but electrical generation yeah. power, right? Yeah, but exactly. isn't that, but it, it's one of the issues that I've thought about quite a lot in the United States here. And that's one of the key problems, right? Is that the ownership of the electric grid in the United States is so diffused. We have 900 yeah. electric co-ops, hundreds of publicly owned utilities. Uh, you know, we have the government power providers, we have the, the investor owned utilities, and that there's not a big enough well, I mean, there's a lot of capital available, uh, available, but there are all these different pieces that are geographically separate and different political, um, uh, different p centers of, of economic and political power within those grids, right? That makes it, is it that, is that, in your view, is that, is it, is that one of the things that's going to limit the growth of nuclear in the United States? Is that a constraint, do you think? I think it's a, it's a, you know, as long, certainly as long as um, the sort of technology of choice is a one gigawatt light water reactor, yes, that is absolutely, we're not going to, I don't believe we're going to build any more of those in the U.S. Right. So if there's going to be a future for nuclear in this country, it's going to be look, it's going to look like new scale, you know, right. or Oklo or one of these sort of with much smaller, very different technologies that, you know, they can be financed with, project, private project finance. They don't 
you know, functionally, you just can't build a, a, a large nuclear reactor anywhere in the world without basically publicly financing it. Um, because the costs are in the tens of billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, if we were like, you know, and I wrote a piece a, a couple of years ago called The Empty Radicalism of the Climate Apocalypse, um, where I just pointed out that for all this talk of having to end capitalism and, and um, you know, we need to totally different model, like, like if you really believe that and you really believe there was this climate apocalypse, you just go nationalize the power sector and build big nuclear plants as fast as you can. And that would work. Like we know it works. We've done it before. Sure. Um, but for all this talk about, you know, how people are, we're socialists and we don't like capitalism and we hate corporations, the whole kind of model for the left is still basically, you know, this sort of what they call neoliberal, you know, they, they, they attack it as neoliberalism, but they're actually really all neoliberals. They want to just basically give big subsidies to big corporations to build wind and solar. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and they want to, you know, privatize and, you know, they, they want to sort of liberalize these, these, uh, the regulation of these powers. So you go and you talk to these environmental champions who are all like, you know, capitalism and climate change are incompatible things. And then you kind of get to the bottom of it and they all want to deregulate the power sector and subsidize corporations to build windmills. Um, <laughs> Let's you know. have a bake sale for Exelon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was one of the, I mean, and that's the joke I made about the, you know, the joke I make about Illinois, right? And well, well, here's a $35 billion corporation. They're asking to be, get more, more profits from their nuclear plants, which from a business standpoint is perfectly understandable. And I don't begrudge them that. Right. But it, there, it, this isn't the, the Sisters of Charity here. Yeah. You know. No, um, no, well, let's talk about New Scale because that was one of the other things that uh, two of your, your colleagues, uh, Zeke Hausfather and Andrew Fletcher, just wrote about that and, and talked about their, the possibility of, of or if New Scale and their, their uh, 60 megawatts electric re reactor, whether, which now has had positive uh, 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 regulatory uh, decisions from the, the NRC, um, that they said that uh, the, the only way that it, it will, it, it, I'll read it here, New Scale is most likely to garner public and private investment if natural gas prices are high, which seems unlikely at the moment, if lower discount rates are used, and if low carbon energy is subsidized. Otherwise, it will need to be publicly funded. So it's right on point with what we're discussing here, right, about this, the, the, the difficulty of nuclear is that it needs this government backing at state level, federal level, and 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 summoning that backing is 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 the political is a big political challenge is that is that fair look look i mean yeah that's fair on the other hand it's like you know look if we gave new scale two cents a kilowatt hour um to build as many plants as they could I, they'd be quite quite economically competitive with gas and wind and solar um which is that and that's what and that. that's what winds give so, so your argument would be well if we're giving that two cents to, to win let's give it to nuclear then is that a right, fair summary right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we should be, we should be tech, you know, we should be technologically neutral in our subsidies for clean energy if we really want, uh, uh, if we want clean energy. But, you know, the other thing with New Scale, and we'll see what happens with New Scale, we'll see what happens with Oklo, we'll see what happens with some of these other things. You, we have a paper coming out, uh, uh, a couple of my colleagues do, uh, Jessica Lovering, who you know, and I think I've had on the show, and Jameson yeah. McBride, um, looking at sort of, what the sort of plausible trajectories are in terms of kind of costs and learning rates for advanced nuclear technology. So my bet, uh, and we published a thing uh, kind of making the case for micronuclear, is that the thing that's going to kind of succeed, that's most likely to succeed, is the thing that can kind of get the most learning um, uh, in terms of just kind of building a bunch of the things so you get better and so you get better supply chains set up and you improve your production processes and all of that. That's going to be Oklo. Um, so because, who, who can build the most, the fastest is yeah, going to be the winner. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Because I think that when, when all said and done, I, I don't, you know, if you look at it per kind of megawatt or whatever, these first of kind reactors are all going to cost about, you know, not that different. That, right. that a, a two megawatt Oklo, a 60 megawatt new scale and a, uh, one gigawatt, um, AP you know, uh, AP yeah. 1000, when you kind of go to the sort of capital cost per megawatt, those first of a kind, they're all going to be pretty close. They're going to be a lot. They're going to be five, you know, four or five, 6,000 a megawatt. Um, right. But, um, you know, if that they Oklo, a, if they can build a thousand, if they can build a thousand, <laughs> if they can build a thousand of them, then that's a different story. Right, right, right. 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 Um, so, 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 you know, my bet, you know, without making any claims about 
Oklo's actual technology is that um, is that smaller uh, smaller will win. Uh, you know, huh. what, what was your book? You wrote a book that's smaller, uh, smaller, faster, lighter, denser, cheaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. That, 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 that the smaller, well, I, I think there's yeah. some, there's some, there's, there's some truth to that. And I, it, one of the, the comparison I make is, well, why does Toyota, why is why are they so good at building engines? Cause they build them by the millions. Right. And then right. And they build a million more. And, uh, yeah. So, um, well, so let me talk about your uncle. And before yeah. I do, can you adjust your, your, your screen again a little bit? Cause you're getting another flare there. Just the, the sunlight is I'm still, Other getting, way? I'm still getting, well, I'm still getting this uh, flare that's now running this way on your face. Can you tilt that? Yeah, there you go. How about that's, that? That's that's better. Good. Okay, so let's talk about your uncle, your uncle uh, William Nordhaus. Um, as I said before, I don't know anybody who's kin to people who've won the Nobel Prize. You went to Oslo. I've, I saw a photo. I think Jesse yeah. Osabel posted. You were you were there. What was that like to go to see your? Uh, you know, it was Nobel kind of a once in a lifetime experience. Um, I don't think anyone else in my family is going to win a Nobel Prize, and I certainly don't think I'm going to win one. So I think this was my uh, <laughs> my first and only. Uh, I was in Oslo, actually Stockholm. Oslo Stockholm. is where they do the Peace Prize, and Stockholm is where they do all the other uh, prizes. And See, I, if only you know, I knew my Nobel. You yes, know. exactly. I know much more about the Nobel now than I ever thought I would know. Um, but um, you slapped me down on that one. Oh well, you know, so Sweden, whatever. Sweden, you know. Oslo, whatever. It's all the same, right? It's just Scandinavia. <laughs> They're up there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> so what was that like? I mean, it must have been quite a thrill. And you, you were white tie and tails, was it? Was it at the? Uh, the yeah, the, yeah. You gotta. Uh, you have to wear. Uh, I think it's white tails. I don't know. I've never. I've never worn a thing like that before. I'll probably never one wear one again. But yeah, I had to go out and you know, there's a whole operation to rent the. You know, it's all rent. You know, nobody, almost no one owns their own. Uh, you know, tails. Uh, so you know, you go. They literally set up in the lobby of this huge hotel, like they the 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 rental place is just set up and and kind of take the measurements and and uh, get everyone sort of decked out and so everyone's wearing the same suit from the same huge rental place in, <laughs> in Stockholm, um, except for me because I went somehow uh, uh, I went off brand and and went and rented from a different place which. Uh -huh. um, I think I, and, and I, I think my tuxedo was not as nice. <laughs> okay. So now we'll go from the tuxedos back to your, your, uh, William Nordhaus's work. I actually cited his work in my, in my new book, A Question of Power, because of a 2010 report he did, which I thought was really interesting, to, uh, looking at satellite data on nighttime luminosity, right? L measuring lights at night in different parts of the world. And that that correlated pretty closely with economic growth and, and development. Right. Um, but his uh, the points that he made in his in his uh, accepted speech, he talked about, and he won the prize for uh, his work on climate change and 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 carbon pricing. He said that uh, nations must raise the price of CO two and greenhouse gas emissions, um, and he said policies must be global and not just national or local. The best hope for effective coordination is a climate club. What about the carbon tax? What about a carbon yeah. price? Are, have you argued with your uncle on this? What's the difference? Yeah, here? yeah, we we argue about it a lot. Uh, I do I don't oppose a carbon price, um, uh, but I also don't think it's likely to be the sort of central strategy for addressing climate change, uh, for a bunch of reasons. One of which are the sort of coordination problems globally that the climate club is intended to address, and I I just don't think that's a viable. Uh, sort of framework uh, uh, internationally for a bunch of different reasons. And also can, because- Can you, give me, can um, you just give me a, a one or two reasons then? Why? Because I have my it, own reasons, right? We don't have yeah, an international well, agreement there's on- sort of, there's, uh, you know, nations have other geopolitical priorities. Um, besides so, climate change. Pardon? Besides climate change. Besides climate change. Um, so, you know, the idea that we're going to kind of create these climate clubs and sort of lock out countries that sort of don't enforce a carbon tax, uh, you know, an appropriate carbon fee. It just, it just like, you know, this country is going to be like, well, I could do that or I could go trade. The only way that the carbon price works is if you have a globally harmonized carbon price. Well, globally harmonized carbon price is a huge, a much, much greater uh, impact on poor countries and on rich countries. And if you go back and you read like my uncle and the other literature, they go, of course, that's inequitable. So then we have to do a massive global redistribution of wealth so that we can put the carbon, the globally harmonized carbon tax in place. And 
you know, honestly, like, like, you know, one of my sort of kind of tells for whether you have, whether a proposal is real, really realistic is if the kind of thing you have to do to make the proposal, the sort of core sort of policy mechanism, in this case, a carbon price work is even more implausible and a heavier lift than the establishing the carbon price, namely massive global redistribution of wealth between co rich countries and poor countries, then I don't think you have a realistic framework for addressing the issue. Can I, can I ask you to restate that? Because I, I, I mean, I, I followed you, but is there, okay. is, is there a simpler way to put it? it Let me see if there's a simpler way to put this. The price of carbon has to be the same in Benin as it is in Saudi Arabia, as it is in the United States. So well, the, Benin, right? Is, so, the, so the first, the first issue that we have to agree on a price for CO two emissions among all the countries of the world, which is and it has to be the same everywhere. If it's it has not to the be same the same, it has, to, it has to be the same everywhere. The carbon intensive production just moves to the places where the price is lower. We also have to have a massive program to redistribute wealth from rich countries to poor countries so that it will be equitable. So, so that second thing, as preposterous as this globally harmonized carbon price is, the second thing that's necessary to make it equitable is even more preposterous. It's not going to happen. Um, Which means uh, it, and that redistribution would mean that you and I and a lot of other people in the United States would have to agree to our tax money going to Benin or Nigeria right. or somewhere else around the world where we're I'd actually sure. be willing. I'd be willing to do that. I, I, I think that we're rich enough that we could probably kind of share some of that wealth with, with uh, more of our wealth with really poor countries um, where people are really sort of struggling, but, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree. Um, so your your the last point on on uh, the the Nobel and 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 William Nordhaus. He also said in his uh, acceptance speech or his presentation, he said rapid technological change in the energy sector is essential. Um, and I've looked at this quite a lot. And you know the the rates of decarbonization globally are very slow. And you've talked about innovation, and and you know this is kind of the buzzword. Oh, we'll just have some more innovation in the energy sector, as though no one's thought about that before. <laughs> you know, right, that this, right, no right. one has been really trying to innovate in all these decades, despite the fact that it's a $2 trillion a year business. So how bullish are you on this idea that technological change can happen at a scale that is going to make a difference in a world where we're using, you know, this, what, you know, 270, 280 million barrels of oil equivalent per day. It's a massive market. How, I mean, I think I, I, you know, the funny thing is I think it's already happening and we just don't actually count it. Um, so where so, do you see the most promising moves then? What, where do you I see I mean, that? you know, look, we already, like, we've had this huge, you know, shale gas revolution. Um, you know, uh, coal, you know, which, you know, King Coal is not dead. It's going to be with us for a long time. Um, but it's also, uh, you know, we're almost certainly past sort of peak coal, <laughs> um, uh, which, you know, a decade ago, uh, everyone, you know, all of these projections assumed, you know, coal as far as the eye could see. Well, that's not the case anymore. And, you know, it's a bunch of different things. Um, some of it having to do with sort of shifts in the macro economy, some of it having to do with having lots and lots of cheap gas, um, you know, some of it having to do with just increasingly efficient uh, energy technologies of all sorts. Uh, you put that all together and we're kind of past peak coal. Um, right. You know, my colleague Zeke Hausfather, uh, you know, did a, uh, published a very, very influential analysis in, in nature, um, just sort of demonstrating that as opposed to a lot of these really apocalyptic uh, kind of catastrophic views of sort of what business as usual through this century looked like, which would be, you know, four, five, six degrees of warming, it's more likely three degrees. Um, uh, is sort of what BAU is. So that's not just because like people got the future wrong. It's because the future changed. Um, mm. uh, you know, because we're terrible, as you know, we're terrible at projecting projecting energy futures. Um, right. So, well, so if but, I could reflect back to you, so I mean, and I think you're well. I, I completely agree that I mean the biggest innovation, the biggest technological change has been the shale revolution, which has allowed sh gas to replace a lot of coal, both here in the US and in Europe, and now I think increasingly around the world. But I guess the key question is, can these alternatives, the lower carbon alternatives, yeah. nuclear and renewables, 
well, we've talked about nuclear. Where, where are the areas in renewables? I'll ask the question this way. Where are the areas in the renewables that you see that innovation having the most promise? And is it storage? Is it solar? Is it wind? What, what part of that do you I see? Mean, I, think, I, think, I think there's a lot of promise on some of these big offshore wind technologies. Right. Okay. You know, solar continues to get cheaper a lot of places. Um, you know, I think the dirty secret of renewables is that the really sort of cheap killer app for renewables is renewables plus gas. Right. You know, now, now all of the environmentalists who are like renewables are the future are like gas is this sort of demon fuel that, you know, is worse than coal, which is just complete nonsense. Um, but, but, you know, the reality is that, you know, I think kind of really cheap renewables with reasonably cheap gas is going to be a pretty reasonable low carbon pathway for a long time, a lot of places. Um, that's where we're going to go. That's, that's um, certainly what it looks like here in the United States, I think, yeah, because nuclear is nuclear's being phased out, coal is being phased out, and it's being replaced largely with gas. And I, I see it, the way I see it is that's, that's the battle in the U.S. now, in the electric grid. It's between gas and renewables for market share. That's Right, right. And, you know, I mean, the, re the reality is, you know, uh, I, I think if you look at the analysis, and we've done some, you know, uh, uh, renewables have displaced a fair amount of fossil fuel over the last five, six years in the U.S. Um, you know, we've done it at not insignificant cost in terms of subsidies and, and, and implicit and explicit subsidies for those technologies. But, um, you know, you kind of get uh, gas displacing coal and also nuclear. You get a bunch more renewables on the grid. And as those renewables kind of continue to get cheaper, they displace more of the gas. They're never going to drive the gas out of the grid because you need it uh, to fo follow loads and, and for backup and all the things we know that renewables can't do. Um, but, you know, that gets you to sort of over the long term kind of continuing decarbonization of the power sector uh, for quite a while. I think we're going to need nuclear or you're going to need storage or you're going to need some other sort of low, very low carbon technology um, if you're really going to fully decarbonize or even mostly decarbonize the power sector, much less get beyond the power sector. Or right. you're going to need carbon capture of some sort, um, right. probably gas with carbon capture as opposed to coal with carbon capture. Sure. Um, well, and I, I don't want to go into that right now, yep. but I think the decarbonization of the transport sector is going to be, that's going to be much more difficult, much yep. more difficult than the, than the electric sector. So yep. let me just hit a, a few more questions and, and then, uh, you know, because we've been talking for an hour or so. So what's your prediction on the election? What do you, what do you, how do you see this? Uh, how do you, we're, we're, we're a few weeks out. What do you, right. what do you what, give me your crystal ball. Boy, uh, you know, I mean, look, look, I think that if all the votes get cast and counted, Biden will be the next president um, and uh, Democrats will probably have a decent majority in the House and a narrow majority in the Senate. Um, getting from here to there, I think, is going to be a really, really rocky road. I'm not sure that either side is going to accept the outcome of whoever loses is going to accept the outcome of the election. I think we're in for a kind of a, a really hard, uh, you know, period around this election. Uh, I think we were talking before we came sort of on the air about climate, and you know, I think if and, Democrats and, and 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 in particular about what will the what will the Democrats do? What do you how do you, what do you think that that given you've looked at Biden's platform, so have I. Yeah. What when, what do you think they're going to be their key priorities? I, I mean, I here here's what I think. I think that there's going to be that there has been a big shift in what there. What there's a shift in what Democrats say, right? Which is you hard you hear almost nothing about pricing carbon or cap and trade or any of that. Um, they're very apocalyptic about climate change, but when you get to the solutions, it's all Green New Deal. It's sort of we're going to grow the economy with big public investments, uh, lots know, of jobs, lots of jobs, all of that. You know, this is really kind of the 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 the, the, the for better or worse the sort of meme the framing for sort of climate action that I uh, and, and uh, with Michael Schellenberger and some others invented almost 20 years ago. Um, and this is now basically the democratic plat program. Um, so I, I think, you know, for instance, I think we're gonna see a very big difference this time around. And I have a piece coming out in foreign policy in a couple of weeks uh, to this effect. But I think we're going to see a very big difference. A big, a big difference under Biden uh, in versus 2021 Obama. than yeah. versus Obama yeah. in 2009. Yeah. And the key differences will be what? I'm sorry? Well, the key difference. So, so in, 20, in 2009, the idea was they would do some sort of investments in technology and green jobs and that kind of stuff through the stimulus. And they did about $90 billion in the, in the 2009 stimulus. But then the main event was going to be this cap and trade bill. 
Um, there's no main event. All of the action, if there's a Democratic Congress and, and a Biden administration, it's going to be in stimulus and it's going to be in sort of economic recovery programs. Um, and they're just going to actually just sort of do just sort of direct public investment in infrastructure and technology um, in the kind of under the guise of stimulus and economic recovery. Um, uh, so and does, that mean, does that mean extension of the, of the tax credits then for the IT? I, I would guess they'll of... extend the tax credits for wind and solar. I think they'll extend various sorts of supports for nuclear. I think they'll try to do a, a, a clean energy standard, a federal clean energy standard in the power sector. Uh, I think they'll put a lot of money into, uh, you know, in energy innovation. Um, uh, and they'll put a lot of money into, you know, I think they'll really try to kind of actually put a lot of money into transmission because I think there's, everybody knows that there's real limits uh, in terms of how much renewables you can do unless you can sort of really move that power around uh, a lot more freely than we can move it around now. Um, so I, I, that's just, you know, I think they'll put a bunch of money into sort of subsidies for electric vehicles and also to sort of trying to build out tra charging infrastructure and things like that. Um, right. So it's just going to be technology. It's going to be technology and infrastructure, which, you know, love or hate Democrats, love or hate Biden, love or hate the kind of rhetoric of climate. You know, I think that's a far better framework for climate action than this idea that we're going to sort of try to put in place this massive federal regulatory, um, you know, economy wide regulatory framework to deal with climate change. I honestly, you know, there'll be waste, there'll be bad investments, there'll be stupid policies. But they'll actually all be a much sort of smaller bore as opposed to sort of putting in place a U.S. equivalent to something like the European emissions trading scheme, I you see. know, which which is just a full on scam, right. um, you know. Yeah. And had my, no my, first, my first book was on Enron, the idea of giving, yeah. you know, creating some carbon trading mechanism. Yeah. They, okay, Look, I'll tell you, is... just, just to put a finer point on it, I will take Solyndra over Enron every time. <laughs> I'm glad you specified that. Thank you, Ted. Okay, so just the last couple of things. So what are you reading? What, who, whose work do you follow? I'm, you know, I follow Václav Smil. I'm, you know, interested, very interested in what Bill Gates writes and, and right. some other people. Who, who do you follow? You know, I, uh, I actually reviewed Smil's latest book uh, in New Atlantis a couple of months ago, um, which, you know, Smil kind of, the funny thing is that like, you know, people like us like love Smeal, but we forget that Smeal's kind of a degrowth guy too. Yeah. And his latest book is really kind of a full out argument for degrowth. He's, um, he's, he's an ardent pessimist. I don't know whether yeah. it's the Eastern European, the Czech uh, history right, or whatever, right. but that, my, my, my impression has been that people from that part Vakla. of Europe, they just, they don't, uh, they, they seldom have sunny outlooks. Right, <laughs> so I'll right, put it that right. way. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, he is a... Uh, he is perpetually dyspeptic, and that's yeah. sort of what you love about him. Perpetually dyspeptic. I like that. Um, that's good. You know, <laughs> Something but, about which I hope no one ever describes me that way. <laughs> right. I mean, but I think the key thing that I take from Vaclav, what, you know, is, is, just, is just like how emergent sort of energy systems are, um, you know, and you know, I, so from Vaclav- I, 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 I don't, didn't follow you there. How emergent? I'm sorry for- Emergent. Uh, in other words, you know, kind of climate change is a, just an emergent feature of global modernity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's really kind of um, uh, bo both, both the problem and any sort of solution to it is just going to be, it's not going to be centrally planned. It's not going to be top down. Um, you know, it's going to be this sort of very kind of uh, um, sort of muddled, uh, sort of long term, gradual, techn change. gradual technological change shifts in the structure of the global economy. Um, it's, it's just it's just going to be kind of really slow. I think like, you know, you look at, you know, where, where, when I kind of apply Smeal to really thinking about climate change, it's like, you know, I don't think we're going to kind of, I think we're not going to see really more than about three degrees of warming worst case. And I don't think we're going to see less than about two degrees of warming best case. Um, and, so CO2 and, emissions are going to continue rising regardless of what policies might be implemented. No, I don't think they're going to continue rising. I think we actually may have seen, we may be past peak global emissions. I just don't think they're going to fall that fast. Um, right. 
uh, I think, you know, atmospheric concentrations of carbon are going to continue to rise for a long time because for that to stop as opposed to emissions, you have to get emissions close to zero. Right. Because the carbon just stays in the atmosphere. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think that we were going to, we are going to, you know, we're sort of, I think we've hit a plateau in emissions. And then I think we're going to see a very long, long, slow decline in emissions. Um, so, but, so you're, so you're arguing, and I want to, I want to hear else yeah. you're, who else you're reading, but so you're, you're saying what I, I interpret you saying is we're going to have to adapt, right? That there's, we're not going to see these yeah. massive reductions in emissions and adaptation is going to be the key in, 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 in a key response to climate change. Absolutely. I mean, we have a lot less control over the sort of global temperature knob than either sort of activists or policy wonks like to think. Um, I, I like the way you, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, so who else besides Smill to just get you back? You know, on I, read point Smil, there? I read, I read, I read everything that Jesse Ossible writes. Yep. Um, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I've been going back and actually like reading a bunch of my uncle's early stuff. Huh. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, the two things that I think are uh, of his that are actually the most important things to read are none of his like dice carbon cost benefit modeling. I don't believe any of it. I love him. It's great that he did it. It's sort of, I'm, I'm going to remind you, off. he won the Nobel prize and you didn't. So I'm just going yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly about the about but, the dice model and the rest you know, of it, they yeah. do it for the dice model but really he wins it for being kind of basically the first environmental economist you uh -huh. know okay um I, I you know these things are really kind of like they kind of say well for this piece of work but, but so what uh, was it but you specifically were going to say about a couple of things that he he had written his, his uh the work on the sort of satellite imagery of lighting but his work on the falling cost of lighting um, and just how transformational that has been to human societies and, and, and what the kind of real rates of economic growth are once you factor in technological change. Uh, that, that's like I asked, so I was at the Nobel, I mean, I'm in Stockholm and, I, and you know, he gets to invite a bunch of his really important collaborators and colleagues. And so I asked them all what their favorite sort of single piece of work of his was. Mm. And with the exception of one, none of them mentioned dice. Uh, or and and his kind of they all might mention this very very famous paper he wrote on the on the on on estimating the cost of lighting over like two millennium uh -huh. um and, the, and, 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 and seeing and the me, real cost like, falling dramatically yeah yeah i mean and he does it by estimating the amount of labor necessary to kind of right. create like a yeah, a How lumen many hours of, of labor light per lumen, or per right, yeah, right, lumen I remember this paper now. over yeah, time. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. a fascinating. He literally goes and he gets like a, he finds like an old like Babylonian oil lamp, so that he can actually literally estimate, figure out like how much like oil has to go in there and how much labor it takes to produce the oil. So you go back and you read his original paper on climate change from like 1975, uh -huh. um, and. The thing that's amazing about that paper is that just the entire climate debate is laid out in that paper. 1975, you huh. know, there's like ge carbon removal, geoengineering, adaptation, it's all in there. Um, huh. and, and, and the thing that I was struck by, so struck by reading that paper, so we really haven't learned very much since. Like, like <laughs> we've been in 45, this for, in 45 years. 45 years and really we're still sort of arguing about the same things and we don't actually have much more uh, uh, to show for it. We, we don't have much to show for it. We also like, even if you just look at the, the state of the sort of the, of knowledge, all this climate research, all this climate modeling, we still really haven't actually answered these questions with, you know, that in that paper, he's, he proposes like two degrees, just like a rough double, you know, he says, well, let's just say doubling. It's a it's a back of the envelope sort of wild ass guess. Well, it, we're still basically using that, you know. And then we get people saying, "Well, 1.5 because we need more margin for error." But it's all really just kind of these sort of arbitrary um, uh, kind of guesses that we sort of invest with the authority of science. Um, sure. And 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 we just don't really actually have that much more, you know, know, know that much more than we did then. Um, huh about how to solve the problem, about what the costs and benefits really are going to be. About, um, about, the, free, about the free rider, the free rider problem that he's been still talking about. Right, right. It's all, it's, it's sort of all there. 
1975. And it was just, it was quite humbling to read that. And, and that ultimately, that's why he deserves the Nobel Prize um, because he just sort of frames the fundamental questions. Um, he's the first person to do it. Huh. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. So last question here, Ted, um, and, and thanks very much for your time. We've gone in longer than an hour here, but uh, I, you know, you love this stuff. I love this stuff. Uh, so what makes you hopeful? What are you looking when you're looking forward? What, what makes you you've been looking at these issues for a long time? What, what makes you hopeful for the future? You know, I mean, I think that um, there, there are times when I'm not terribly hopeful and having nothing to do with climate change or the environment. Um, and, and just much more kind of, I just think, uh, um, cynical about politics or about yeah, the just sort of the, of the politics and just our, our, our ability to sort of rationalize whatever we want to believe. Um, so, so it's just, it's just, I, I look at, at the quality of discourse. I look at the, all the perverse incentives for extremism on both the left and the right. And I kind of go, you know, certainly in the U S context, sort of our sort of civic culture seems like really, really fundamentally broken right now. And I don't think anyone has any idea how to put it back together, um, uh, least of all me. So that makes me pessimistic. But you know what makes me optimistic is just kind of, um, again, I think maybe as I've gotten a little older, I've just sort of appreciated the value that we just kind of muddle through that, that the things that kind of everyone, for all of the kind of, you know, uh, the right says it's you know another where it's another flight 93 election and the left is like you know another donald trump turn is term is the end of the world and you know uh, we're going to have an election and the next day everyone's going to get up and go back to work um and go back to their sort of daily lives and and you know i think the things that are kind of really likely to matter are not the things that everyone spends most of their time arguing about um so uh you know, I do think that, um, uh, you know, I kind of go like, uh, you know, it's funny, I look at the thing that gives me hope, actually, just to kind of really crystallize it, it's the shale revolution. Huh. And not, not, you know, not because, you know, it's like it's reduced emissions, but I kind of go like, you know, and we, you know, I wrote a lot about it, uh, and did a lot of the original work kind of documenting kind of where how that really happened. Um, um, and, you know, there were like these DOE laboratories, and there was this gas uh, what was it called? The uh, Gas Research Institute that that like the industry sort of with support, federal support funded to try to sort of figure out how to get gas out of these. And nobody believed it. No one believed it would work. No one thought it was important. It was just this little backwater sort of part of DOE and a couple of the national laboratories with these kind of, you know, oil and gas guys who no one had ever heard of just working away for like 30 years. Um, and, and you get this kind of world changing technology, huh. um, you know, that that's interesting. I, you know, the things that nobody I would, saw I would, that I would guess that you would say about made you hopeful that would be what not be the one that would be yeah. on the list. But yeah, but I, I mean, you're right. It's an example of innovation, an example of private capital, an example of of, of good old fashioned stick to itiveness, right? Of, um, among yeah. people who had a lot of stake also, and wanted you know, to do something this different. Key invention. There's also like a lot of federal policy support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like every one of the kind of key technologies, or you can trace almost all of it from micro seismic imaging to, um, you know, all of the uh, early kind of experiments, um, uh, you know, back in the 70s with the massive hydraulic fracturing. Um, you know, a bunch of that stuff didn't work initially, but then like the private guys take it and figure out how to make it work, which is often how innovation works. Um, so, so, you know, I'm kind of like, that gives me some hope and I'm kind of like, you know, I look at an Oklo, I look at some of these other small nuclear sort of start, you know, and, and really kind of, I think the sort of consensus in energy circles is still that like, it's not going to work. And if it's going to work, it's going to be some big government, you know, it's going to be like the ITER fusion, or it's going to be like the sort of China, one of these big Chinese nuclear kind of development projects. And I kind of go like, you know, I just think one of those little startups is actually, you know, with a lot of public support, you know, with technologies that were originally, you know, originally developed by national laboratories is going to figure this out. No, I appreciate that. That's uh, that's interesting take. I like that. Well, Ted Nordhaus, thank you. This is, uh, it's been great. You know, it's great to reconnect and, and to uh, uh, talk about um, uh, Breakthrough Institute. Um, uh, to remind all of you listeners, then go to uh, thebreakthrough.org. 
Uh, you can follow Ted on Twitter at Ted Nordhaus. Uh, the Breakthrough Institute is on Twitter at, at the BTI. Have I got it right? Uh, yep. Any other uh, closing thoughts here, Ted? Anything you just want to cover uh, before well, Robert, we Robert, I hope we'll off? see you at a Breakthrough Dialogue next year if we can all kind of get together and uh, right. been can a I, long Can, I, can I wear my mask, please? <laughs> we, we, you, you, you will, uh, it, it will be a logoed mask. Yeah, I hope so. Well, no, that's very kind. I appreciate it and, and, and love to uh, make that happen. Uh, so uh, we'll sign off here. Thanks to all of you for listening. This is the Power Hungry Podcast. If you want to help us out, subscribe. If you want to really help us out, go to ratethispodcast.com slash power hungry and give us five, six, 12, 14 stars on that thing. Um, and uh, thanks again to Ted Nordhaus and uh, come back for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for having me, Robert. Thanks, Ted.